You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop, the show that's a little bit of everything with a K-Pop twist. Visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com for more information about the show. That's 17-C-A-R-A-T-K-P-O-P.weebly.com. Enjoy the show! Hello everybody, Hope here, and welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop. At long last, the vix themed episode is here, so for our bonus theme of the day, I will be talking all about the vix music video universe, all the wild storylines, all the connections to mythology, all of that. But before I get to that, there are a lot of other updates in the world of K-pop and the music industry as a whole that we've got to talk about. We have to talk about KCON and the latest updates with that, as well as other virtual events. And some other unique forms concerts have been taking these days. More updates about that. More mergers between video game companies and musicians and apps and things like that. An increasingly VR-focused media climate in this day and age. I've got to give my review of Sour Candy, of course. We've got to talk about the big Lovelies forgery issue. This allegedly controversial subway advertisement. There's some court cases and legal drama we need to address, some music chart ranking changes in terms of qualifications for chart rankings. There's music recommendations I've got to give you and YouTube viewing recommendations. There is just a whole bunch of stuff beyond all that too to get to, so let's just get right into it. The first story I want to talk about is Big Hit Entertainment. So... Basically, it is now believed that Big Hit Entertainment did the most Big Hit Entertainment thing possible. Like I cannot picture any other music agency doing this, but they underreported the sales of their own music. So, and I guess it is a, it is a serious issue in terms of re- the legitimacy of chart rankings, so I get that, and it's a headache now to go back and double check everything but it is a little funny honestly to think about how usually the backlash comes when companies inflate the amount of sales they had but big hit just underreported themselves so basically what happened was uh, bts release this isn't even their latest release but one of their previous album releases map of the soul persona the sales were underreported, so basically all these records we were celebrating that BTS broke in terms of album sales, we actually should have even had more of those celebrations, and they actually could have surpassed that album sale count by a whole lot. Basically, to figure out that information, I'm not going to get into the whole nitty gritty of it, but for the sake of the story, what you need to know is that these music companies send their info to the IFPI, the International Federation of Phonographic Industry, I believe, or International Federal, uh, no, it's got to be Federation of Phonographics. Anyway, the IFPI basically keeps track of album sales, and that in turn influences the chart rankings. And so what Big Hit Entertainment did, basically, is it submitted its info to the IFPI that was from other charts. So basically, yeah, again, I won't get into the nitty gritty, but the super simplified version of this situation is that music companies have this raw data about album sales that they then pass on to other agencies and intermediaries who in turn pass on the information to the IFPI. But So it adds levels of oversight and review to the process, but what Big Hit did is they basically just gave these this intermediary the go ahead to submit their chart rankings and or album sale rankings to IFPI to affect the chart rankings. So basically, instead of sending their raw data and raw numbers to the IFPI, they basically just had the other source send it in. So the original counts were not given. So that's where the the miscommunication occurred. So it was probably undercounted. And there was also probably some debate because the IFPI ch- labels certain things EPs versus albums. In Map of the Soul Persona, it's, it's pretty short. So with less than 10 tracks, it seems like it would be 
a an EP, not an album, but technically for the IFPI standards, to qualify as an album, it needs to be at least 25 minutes long in running time and have at least five tracks. So Map of the Soul Persona checks off both of those boxes. So, but it also seem, it seems like it's an EP. It was kind of advertised as an EP or a mini album, a little precursor to the Map of the Soul 7, which was a whole repackage of Persona plus more new songs. So anyway, so the bottom line is that Big Hit ran into some issues because they didn't submit the raw data to the IFPI, and they may have classified this as an EP when it actually did qualify as an album. So basically, it's just this is just all to say that BTS actually deserves even more recognition for that masterpiece of an album. In a little less confusing, to me at least, of a chart-related story. So the Melon charts, which are kind of like, I guess, iTunes or Billboard charts, but for what it, what music is trending in Korea at the moment, the Melon charts have decided that they are going to be restructuring how they rank music on the real-time charts. So the updates include that view counts will influence the charts more in terms of individual listeners. So unique account listeners will be the big factor in deciding what is the most popular song of the moment and what gets ranked higher on the chart. Also, they are going to have the chart refreshed every 24 hours as opposed to once an hour. And people are, have kind of a mixed reaction to this. And the company has basically said they want to change what how you look at the chart and see what's you know number one or number two in the country at the moment just because they want to change it to be to seem basically about the music so they basically seem to be doing this because at least their official argument is that they want to do this because they want this to be less about fandoms competing and getting into a competition over which son wins each hour and just be about genuinely what music is trending in Korea at the moment. So they want that focus to happen, so less fandom competition. Will it work? I don't know. Um, but based on fandom reactions online, it sounds like actually the girl group fandoms are really into this and think it'll benefit girl group streaming because, and honestly, based on what I've seen online and the fandom streaming habits I've gotten into and the streaming parties and marathon streaming sessions and whatnot that I've been involved in, in boy group fandoms, I can I can definitely see why this change would benefit girl groups with streaming because it just gets rid of that competitiveness. And so and I mean to be fair, like I I'm not dissing boy groups or girl groups uh, fandoms because I'm in some of both, but the streaming habits do seem to be different, and both for better and for worse, so people can get way too competitive in every fandom about that chart ranking, which really, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, and that, but then also it is a cool sense of pride for your artist, especially the underdog artist, when you see them rise in the charts, so it's kind of a mixed bag. The competition can be fun, but also taken way too seriously. But anyway, the reason it might benefit girl groups is because it does seem like girl group fandoms streaming is just consistent. Every day they listen to those songs. I know I'm super generalizing, but this is what the main argument online has been lately as people talk about this chart change. And then the boy group fandoms, you know, it seems like there's a lot more marathon streaming because the goal is to keep it. The goal is not how do we make sure their song tops the charts every day. It's how do we make sure the song tops the charts every hour and doesn't fall in the rankings. It's kind of like a Twitter trend, you know, how if a hashtag's trending, but after the hour's up, you have to kind of re start over if you want it to keep trending. It's sort of like that but with the music charts. And so this structure will hopefully, honestly, it sounds like it, it'll do more help than harm because it'll 
really show what is popular, what's the trending music, and not how that's manipulated by streaming parties as much. And as fun as it is to feel like we did it and we were a part of getting our face to hit number one or number two or whatever, it's also just seems fair and will make it less of a headache for everyone involved, less of a sense of just jealousy and petty competition between fandoms if there's not an hour-to-hour debate about who deserves to be number one and accusing people of manipulating the charts or whatever. So that is what the update is. It's not even in place yet, but people are already talking about it a lot, so you'll probably hear a lot more from uh, Melon Charts in the near future. All right, let's move on to talking about some legal developments. So there are a variety of court case situations that have updates now we've got to talk about. First of all, we've got to talk about, this is about the music industry more broadly, but there is a lawsuit that has been filed against the Ultra Music Festival. So some ticket purchasers for this EDM festival in Miami, which was canceled due to COVID-19, they have issued a lawsuit. Basically, because They claim the ticket refund policies were unfair and essentially a scam. Basically, they're doing what Ultra Music Festival is doing, what Ticketmaster seems to be doing a lot, and what other ticket companies are doing now because so many people want refunds for their shows. They're making it super hard to get those refunds because they want to keep your money. And so, basically, what Ultra is doing is not offering cash refunds, really. So you can get a refund in the form of... Uh, a discount on merchandise from them or some other discount or some money off of your future payment with them and things like that. So basically deals and sales and they also have like trading options so you could just say just move my money I guess to a different ultra music festival event or merch package or something. Basically they want to find ways to show that you did get something for your book, but not give you back your book. And so a lot of companies seem to be doing that, and Ticketmaster has also come under fire for that because of basically trying to incentivize people to to let them keep your money because then they'll in turn give you a much cheaper ticket to a future show run by them as opposed to giving you back your money. So... Anyway, so Ultra Music Festival is is getting faced with this lawsuit, and I'll keep you posted how it goes. It's a class action lawsuit, meaning that any ticket purchaser who wants to get involved can join on to the lawsuit. It's a group lawsuit, and we'll see what happens. They want financial compensation. I'm not sure in what the Miami law says about what qualifies as an actual illegal scam, and I'm not sure if this does, but it is deceptive marketing in a way. I'm not sure how easy it will be to prove that in court, though. But, I mean, the big sticking point is the fact that there's such a small window. So there's a 30-day window that they gave. I think the big... The easiest way to prove in court deceit in this case would probably have to do with the window of availability for a refund. So if you even want to use their uh, discount options, you have to do it within 30 days of getting the email, I believe. So that's the sticking point. And actually, BTS fans have been upset over that too because it wasn't that apparently you could get a refund or some sort of financial compensation for the postponed BTS shows within 30 days, not of when they announce a new date, which they the wording made it sound like that's kind of what they meant, but thir- within 30 days of them sending you the email about 30 days. So the email was not, it, the emails were sent out to BTS ticket holders to basically say, so you can get a refund but within the next 30 days. But the email made it sound like, look, this email is basically to tell you that the shows postpone refunds are on the way when really or like you know we'll give you the 30-day window soon but the email also doubled as that 30-day warning so the clock already started ticking before people realized it so anyway so not sure how that's all gonna play out but just know that it's probably the first of many lawsuits of their kind as events continue to be canceled and 
or just postponed further and further into the future. People want their money back for the time being, and we'll see what happens with that. Uh, in speaking of uh, get-rich schemes, I guess, so there is an issue where online someone is trying to sell a an autographed Lovelies album. So this auto, this Lovelies autographed album is basically a forged autograph that makes it look like someone someone's trying to sell an album that looks like the K-pop group Oh My Girl wrote a special message and all signed a copy of an album for Lovelies. Or maybe it was vice versa, Lovelies signed for Oh My Girl. No, I believe it was Oh My Girl for Lovelies. Anyway, so K-pop girl group album forgery is the issue because the whole signature and message is forged and so their their company is pursuing legal action they they started the bidding at $56 that's the USD equivalent $56 for that autograph so honestly i think their signature should be worth more than that but that's beside the point so someone's trying to make a quick buck off of that and it's interesting that they're pursuing legal action because i feel like that probably happens a lot more than we think and we just don't hear about it so yeah i i we'll see what happens with that and speaking of more uh court drama so and legal drama so park yujun yet uh known of a lot of scandals the burning sun scandal all of the sub scandals there's a lot um we're not going to go into it all again but yeah one of the burning sun scandal affiliated people who after being uh after having his career disgraced and his reputation rightfully tainted due to his involvement in the scandal he announced his retirement from the from public life and from the music industry the acting industry etc like out of the media but now he wants to come back so he's going to have a fan meeting online i guess june 4th and it will be free so so i have two main thoughts about that one is that no go away <laughs> we're not ready to forgive you nor do will we ever be go away. You said you were retiring, and we were all fine with that. My second thought is that well, at least it's free. Honestly, if he was charging people about like more than a penny, <laughs> if he was charging people for for going for a virtual fan meet with him, that just feels very scummy. Like you can't come back crawling back to the industry now. It's just I just I'm very resentful and holding a grudge against him. So, oh, speaking of grudges, so the 20th General Assembly recently parted ways it ended. And so if you want to get new laws passed and propose new laws in South Korea right now, you have to wait for the 21st General Assembly to meet. And so Hara's brother is going to do that. So quick uh, backstory after um, there was a lot of drama when Hara passed away and her mother who had been absent from most of her childhood, suddenly swept back into her life and wanted to claim half of her inheritance. And there were there were a lot of other statements made and rumors flying about how she asked different celebrities for autographs and stuff at her daughter's funeral and all this other horrible stuff. And I can't confirm any of that, but there are a lot of a lot of corroborating statements about her behavior being very selfish and ignorant and all of that and just cruel after Hara's passing. And anyway, so Hara's brother has tried to pass this law called Hara's Law, which basically would change how the law currently is, where if someone passes away and their parents are still alive, their parents automatically are entitled to their inheritance in a typically equally split way among the parents. But in this, but basically Hara's law would change that so that if there are specific issues such as, well, there are a few, so they want to expand what is, so basically there are only a few ways that your parent, if you pass away, does not automatically get your inheritance money at least in South Korea that's how the law works and so basically Har's brother wants to expand the amount of the amount of exceptions 
to getting that inheritance, and he wants to include the fact that you're an absentee parent for the majority of your kid's life, then you cannot legally be allowed to just swoop in and get the inheritance money. And the law did not pass the General Assembly, not because it was viewed as not valid in terms of standing up to legal scrutiny, but really they didn't have time for it. It was a big caseload and they did not get to it. It was low on their priorities list of laws they wanted to pass, but they did encourage Hara's brother to come back. So after revisions and updates to this law, it will be re-proposed in the 21st General Assembly. So I will keep you posted on if that law passes and what happens there. More legal issues. I believe there are two more we've got to talk about. So, the um, so Hassan Su, he basically he's a songwriter who has been accused of illegally profiting off of some songwriting by taking way more songwriting credits than he deserves. He helped manage Eyes One, but actually left that agency recently. But anyway, so. He is the CD, the CEO of Pletus Entertainment, and he worked with Eyes One, but he basically put his wife's name on songwriting credits for eight Eyes One songs. So for eight Eyes One songs, it's it makes it seem like, like he deserves the money for, uh, for helping write those songs, based on the pseudonym. It's a weird, confusing story, but basically. It sounds like his he's trying to both use a pseudonym to get money and use his wife's name to claim that he deserves the credit for the songs. But anyway, what it comes down to is that he basically illegally profited off of those songs and basically misrepresented his wife's title as well. I don't know if that can be a separate charge if this goes to court, but it probably could be because she really she worked in terms of the visual aspects of music videos she does not work in the world of songwriting at all so that was a misleading characterization so we'll see what happens there speaking of eyes one so the show they were created on Pr- produce 101 there have been arrests in that case and officially the people accused of manipulating the voting that affect that that influenced who joined Eyes One and who won the show, the vote riggers have been found guilty and sentenced. So one of them is going to spend two years in prison and another one will spend one year and eight months. And six others actually were fined and not sent to jail. So eight people punished, two are going to prison and six are just getting fined. Finally, one last legal story to get to. So, Irene and Solgi from Red Velvet, they both lent their voices to one of the eight major subway stations in South Korea so that they are the voices who go on the loudspeaker to give subway etiquette and things like that. However, those announcement voices have led to a formal civil complaint filed with a lot of the public sending in their comments criticizing their voices being added to the subway station. Some were kind of civil and polite in the way they worded it, saying that they just don't want to hear their voices because they'd rather just have the workers talk to them. Others saying they just, they don't like having a celebrity tell them what to do. They'd prefer to be a professional, I guess. And others were much nastier about it, had a lot of choice words and we're cruel and it will not be repeated on the show. So people are just kind of up in arms over their voices being on the subway. So I have a couple of big thoughts about that. First of all, that, that it's confusing. My first reaction is confusion. Um, but I don't live in South Korea. Maybe celebrities giving subway announcements is super common. I don't know. I do know that it's a lot more common there, that's for sure, than it is in the USA for K-pop fans to rent out full subway ads and do other big, large-scale, crowdfund- crowd-funded projects to celebrate their favorite K-pop groups, specific idols' birthdays, and other big anniversaries and stuff. So p- big public displays of support for K-pop groups via subway ads and stuff is super 
not abnormal in South Korea. So, but this is a little different, I guess, because this is not a fan-created project. This is just an official thing, an official job that they've been given to give those announcements. I'm not really sure why, but maybe they figured celebrity influence would help people follow the rules. But my first thought was confusion, because just culturally, I don't know if that's normal there to have celebrities giving the announcements. So I, that's my first thought, is just ignorance is my, was my first reaction. And my second reaction was anger, because these people are very up in arms over this. And like I said, one of the eight main subway stations is using their voices. So, I mean, maybe it's a lot more inconvenient to take different subways that run at different times or whatever. So I'm, I get that it's not an option necessarily to just pick a different subway. But if it, there, it seems like the backlash is disproportionate, as if everyone is, everyone has to, no matter where they ride, listen to their voices. And it, it, yeah, it just, and I also can't help but wondering, because this is how I view everything in the world after years of gender studies classes, is how internalized sexism affects who wants to hear whose voices on the subway. But that's a whole other discussion. I don't know. I'm just in general annoyed by this story because I think it'd be awesome to hear their name or their voices on the speaker. And it, I don't know. I'm just, I feel like it's such a disproportionately harsh reaction to an announcement that should probably, I mean, it's probably super short too. So I don't know. I just feel like if there's anything you file an official civil complaint about, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to exert my time and energy on that being the issue I file an official complaint about. I just have better things to do. But that's just my opinion. So let's move on to some different lighter news. So before my sour candy review, I will just say one more quick news update. YG Entertainment is having auditions, but these are different ones than usual. Within So basically, it's been 24 years since this happened. But now they're going to have a producer audition for a full-time in-house producer. So that's very interesting because YG Entertainment stock-wise has been tanking the past year or two. And in general, reputation-wise has also been tanking. So for them to hire a new producer is interesting. I wonder if they'll change more things up administratively and if they're seeking a new direction. Maybe that new direction will involve more support for Blackpink you know, you can dream. So, and there is at least a little bit of that from Blackpink themselves, from their new collab with Lady Gaga, Sour Candy. So my official reaction to Sour Candy is, okay, so I have two re main react, three main reactions. One, it's way too short of a song. Where did the bridge go? It is way too short. Second, it's good. It's a bop. And I'll get, get more into that in a second. And third, I just, I hope they get more promo out of it and we get a video out of it. Because Blackpink's costumes in videos, that, I mean, next level. So them with Lady Gaga wardrobe-wise, can you imagine the costume department section, or the, the costume wardrobe section of the music video shoot for Blackpink and Lady Gaga together? otherworldly. So I really hope we get that video. It sounds like we are. There are a lot of rumors about that. So I would keep your eyes peeled for that video coming pretty soon. So we'll see. But yeah, Sour Candy is a really catchy song. It's just so too short, man. It's way too short. And okay, this people might want to fight me on, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's way better than Rain On Me. I'm not a huge fan of Rain On Me, Gaga's first single, well, no, Stupid Love was the first single, first collab single from Chromatica. Sour Candy's way more catchy than Rain On Me. Yeah, I said it, I said it. Anyway, I'll just, I'm just going to leave that comment out there and uh, let you think it over until you realize I'm right. But critics overall do definitely approve of both songs, and... That is good to see the po the popular critical praise for the song. Sour Candy was tweeted about over 145,000 times before it was released. 
So actually just sour candy is coming. So sour candy was tweeted a lot more than that, but the actual phrase sour candy is coming, just that phrase was on its own tweeted about over 145,000 times. So that is just so exciting for Blackpink. It's been forever since people were talking about them just in general outside of K-pop fandom world. And, you know, the whole world was finally talking about them again. They The song ranked number one in 42 different countries on the iTunes charts. And it hit number six on the global Spotify chart for what people were listening to. And even just the audio. So think about this. This is another reason why we need a Sour Candy music video. Just the audio of this song got over 21, nearly 22 million views in just the first 24 hours. So as of recording time, it probably has at least 22 million views. Just the audio. You know that the video would have 44 million views at least. So, wow, just stay tuned. YouTube will totally crash. Like, it legit might crash after a Sour Candy video comes our way. So, fingers crossed for that. We will see. In a little less exciting news, but I guess it's a good development. So, more doubts have been raised about Dispatch and what they did in terms of the alpaca story and everything. Look, it's a long story that I went into in a previous episode, but... Long story short, with the the alpaca story, long story short, I just like calling it that. The alpaca isn't even the biggest part of the story, but whatever. Long story short, it is basically, basically a group of K-pop stars went out and about one night and were shamed for violating social distancing guidelines and things like that, but there was a lot of dispute as to the timeline, the, the veracity of those claims, how those claims were obtained, where they went when social distancing guidelines were actually lifted in that area, if what they were doing was ethical, etc., etc., etc. But recently there have been more more there have been more revelations because people were wondering, well, wait, if the paparazzi caught them violating social distancing norms, then wasn't the paparazzi also violating them when they got that information? Well apparently the latest is that the dispatch, the members of dispatch who went to report this, did not go report it. They relied entirely on eyewitness accounts, and that was that. They re- they relied on eyewitness accounts, multiple ones to back up each other, but still, just eyewitness accounts. No dispatch reporter actually saw them out and about, and they just went with that. So... There are two main questions you might have after that. One being, well, isn't that still valid information, eyewitness testimony? And the other question might be, well, aren't they probably are still guilty of violating those norms because they said they did and they issued those public apologies. So first of all, on that hand, I will say that that is pretty standard for music companies, at least in the K-pop world, they have their artists issue a formal apology because they want to get the drama behind them, and they say, yep, here's what happened, I'm sorry, I'm reflecting on my actions, let's move on. So that's pretty typical, whether they did it or not, that they are, they must, their agency makes them apologize and say they did it, so that doesn't mean they did. Second thing, eyewitness testimony. So the very first day of my very first criminal justice class in college, the very first day we learned a lesson about eyewitness testimony, when there was a guy who came into the room when we were in class and just, I'm, I don't think it was a stage thing, I legit think it was just some student that had a question for the teacher that that just popped in to ask it, but it was interesting timing and it really taught me a lot because it still sticks with me four years later, so... Anyway, so this student came in there and asked the teacher a question and left. And then the teacher turned to us and asked us, so can you describe him? What was he wearing? What did he look like? What do you remember from like five seconds ago? What color was his hair, shirt, pants, etc.? And people recalled details incorrectly, very incorrectly, like not even just like, oh, he was wearing a burgundy sweatshirt and the teacher was like, no, it was maroon. No, this was like, oh, he was wearing a red shirt and it was actually blue. Like, it was not even close. And then other people just totally forgot or realized they weren't paying attention. So basically, what he what he was trying to teach us by asking us that is that 
what eyewitness testimony has proven time and time again to not be very reliable at all. Because if you think about it, if you're not really looking for something specifically, it's hard to recall what you saw because you hadn't really been seeing it. You'd been seeing it, but you hadn't really been looking at it, if that makes sense. It's like the difference between listening to someone and truly hearing them. There's seeing someone and truly looking at them. And so probably in our daily lives, a lot of the time we recall what someone wore when we talk to them or what someone the look someone had on their face, and we probably aren't remembering it right. That's just not how the human mind works for many people. So anyway, so my point is that if people rely entirely on eyewitnesses, that is not, that doesn't hold up in court if all you're relying on is solely eyewitnesses. So that definitely brings into suspicion which celebrities were even seen in public and what they were seen wearing, and because let's say, I'm not just saying like someone just said, oh, I think I saw Jackson last night out and about, and it turns out it wasn't Jackson. I'm talking about eyewitness testimony, like maybe they said, oh, well, I saw a guy out with a red shirt, and then someone else said, I saw Jackson out last night with a red shirt, and it turns out one of them had a blue shirt on, you know? So the eyewitness issues could have come not from necessarily totally mistaking the identity of the celebrity out and about, but even just, it could have been a mistaken identity based on other variables too that made them think it was the famous person they had seen somewhere else. I don't know. The point is that I'm not sure if they did it or not, and they violated those norms in terms of the messy timeline and stuff, so I'm not trying to pass too much judgment, although I do appreciate that stars are condemned when they social when they don't social distance as opposed to the opposite so I'd much rather have stars come under scrutiny for this than for actually socially distancing and wearing masks and things like that because that's so needed right now we still have some upticks in COVID-19 cases in well around the world but especially in the U.S. right now so I want to see more celebrities in the U.S. encourage social distancing and get on the bandwagon of shaming those who don't in a polite way so in a peaceful way so my those are my thoughts that was a lot of news to get to so let's move on to talking about the latest developments in the world of covid era music creation and concerts i have a lot of thoughts both positive and negative towards KCON 2020 and how this virtual version of KCON is looking. So first of all, the latest developments, KCON has issued some information, but vague amounts of information, further elaborating on their plans for a virtual version of KCON this year. It is going to be the week of June 20th. It will be 24-7 live streamed content, a lot pre-recorded and throwback videos from previous KCONs, but also some new content every day and premium content for $20 you can spend money to get basically extra VIP perks of some sort involved in the convention so everyone can access the stream for free on YouTube but for the specific VIP perks you have to pay $20 and the lineup is going to be huge it's going to have 30 artists I believe and so far the announced artists include so many of my faves and so many of your faves too, I'm sure. So there are rookier, like more rookie groups that are younger, like AB6 and One Us, but there are also groups that are bigger, like Monster X and Stray Kids. Luna is coming back to KCON. Cravity will be there, another rookie group. Monster X and Cravity, so that's a, that's a cool combination. The Boys, Kane Daniel, Golden Child, Pentagon, G Friend, Eyes One, Nature. Am I forgetting anyone? I know Two is going to be there. There's a lot. There's a lot. So, a lot of artists are going to be at KCON. It is a big, it's got a big lineup already, and they're not even done announcing everyone yet. So, the, and then in terms of the specific events being promoted at the event, they basically say there will be three categories of events. One, VIP meet and greet style events. Two, a, a 24 hour thing where every 24 hours they'll switch who the camera is given to and you basically follow 24 hours in the life of a certain band. 
and three, some sort of backstage, behind-the-scenes content. So, my thoughts on this. I have very mixed reactions, very mixed thoughts about this. I am, let's start with the positives. So, I love that it's only $20 for that much content. If you want the VIP content for $20, then that seems to be worth it, although I don't know what it means for VIP content. But if it's like a video call type of thing with your faves for $20, that is so worth it to me. So I think it'll probably be worth it. And in general, I'm, I, I know that, you know, that KCON has to make money. So I'm not too mad about the fact that they're charging at all for live stream content because a lot of it is free. It seems pretty reasonable to me in a year when they have so much financial loss to ask us for $20 for VIP stuff. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Also happy with the lineup. It's got a great mix of younger rookie groups and my favorites. And... So yeah, so those are the positives so far that I see in this. And I also like the fact that it is a, a virtual thing that's happening because I'm just grateful. And it's kind of a way I can still go to KCON, which was going to be my ultimate graduation trip this year. But, you know, that present is out the window now. So this is still kind of that graduation present, I guess. I'm still going to KCON. And a lot of other people get that chance now, too, that maybe no otherwise would not have been able to travel and go there. So it's just giving more fans a chance to see their idols. So overall, it's a great, exciting thing for people to look forward to. So I'm overall still happy for and optimistic about KCON and the people putting on this virtual event. However, my issues, my first issue, I think, comes down to just vagueness. The vagueness is really getting to me. What, like, what does that mean, behind-the-scenes content? Behind-the-scenes content of what? Like, isn't a live stream basically already behind the scenes? Like, a real look at what's happening? Like, I'm just confused what they mean when they say, like, backstage content. Because there's no stage this year. We're all just watching on a live feed. Like... What is backst like what does that even mean? Like I'm just confused. And so that's what's making me hesitant because I want them to prove before I spend my money that it's worth the money. And if their backstage content is just like a fancy way of making the content sound more exclusive when it's just another live stream, then is it gonna be worth the money? And like I said, I think it will be, but and I get that they need to make money and charge us, but I want more information first. I don't think that's too much to ask. And the, the our refund policy is, at least last I checked as a recording time, refund policies on KCON tickets are not easy to find. Nowhere on their website that's easy to find. So, well, yeah, I would like to know what the, what the refund policy would be if I actually agreed to and commit financially to seeing KCON VIP stuff before I know what that entails. So there's that. I also don't get what they mean by 24-hour look into the group member's life because sometimes they do that already. Like NCT already does that or at least has in the past where they do the, they've done like this YouTube series where they like each vlog and hand the camera to each other over the course of 24 hours so you see what a day in the life is like. And so I can get that kind of content in vlogs for free on YouTube. So if that's all it is, that I wouldn't pay for on its own. So that I have questions about too. Also in general, just what the meet and greet looks like. And in general, see my thing is I get bugged by this. They're doing a totally, they're pulling a YG Entertainment move here, which I do not appreciate, which is announcements for the announcements, for the announcements, for the announcements sometimes, where it's like they have these big announcements that are a lot of nothing. Like the announcement of the lineup is great, but I would prefer an announcement of the price which they did give, but all it was was a post with a picture that said price $20 or something like that. So, like, if you're going to have a big announcement, please give us more details and specifics. Because they, and so the announcements have been like that, that I just told you. The announcement has been like, here's the content reveal, and the reveal is the 24-hour thing, the backstage thing, and the meet and greet thing, without specifying what either of those three things includes. 
Or things like, here's the artist lineup, but no specifications about our artists participating in this type of event, or the concert itself, or just a Q&A, no specifications about that. So every announcement is so vague, it's like, well, if the details aren't ready yet, why are you even bothering with this? I'm just confused, and... Yeah, I'm just very frustrated because I want more detail. I really want more detail. I want to, yeah, that that is the bottom line. So really all of my, I had a lot of other frustrations I could air, but it all really boils down to that, is I'm just so confused. How are they doing a virtual convention? I just, what, it, like, can you please explain more? And every resource they post about saying, here's more information, or go to this link for more information, I go to the link and I just get like a lot of the same like very vague wording about this exciting event and all the memories we'll make during it and how much they want our $20 and then nothing else. Or like even the YouTube videos that are advertised, all the YouTube ads for KCON 2020 that they link to for more information gives me the same information, which is a lot of nothing. So come on, I need more information. That is the bottom line. And there's also the thing that I've been wondering about, which is how how much excitement there really is for this. Because one thing I was thinking about was maybe they are just teasing a lot because they want to build up the hype for this event far in advance. Because it's almost June as of recording time, but it's the end of May as I record this. So it's not even June yet, and they want to ramp it up ramp up the hype for this way before June 20th. So that's probably why they're teasing so much, but I just wonder if it's possible now because basically um, the, the latest rate of musicians, not even just live streams in general, but just specifically the musicians having live concert streams has been an average of about 16,000 live streams a month these past few months. So during quarantine, while people are tuning to Instagram Live and YouTube Live all the time to watch live stream concerts, there we've been getting over 16,000 a month on average. So people are kind of burnt out of live streams. The novelty, I think, has already worn off or will wear off soon. It's just, it'll never replace a real concert experience. And so I do wonder how much KCON, how much people are really excited for KCON this year because of live stream fatigue. And so it'll be interesting how that affects sales and stuff. So we'll see. Some people are trying to make the live streams more new and interesting and creative to stand out and avoid that fatigue. Like there's this one singer, Laura Marling, who is basically making it exclusive. So you basically have to pay and get a ticket for a ticketed view of her live stream. And actually it's sold out. So whenever she does that, it sells out. So that says something. So people are willing to still pay for the live stream content. So not everyone is feeling the fatigue, but I just wonder if that affects the hype as well. Because like I said, it's good and bad. It's good morally, bad bad strategically to think about how this KCON will be more, more uh, accessible than ever for people around the world because yes, you get a better chance at meeting your faves and stuff, but so does everyone else. So does that get rid of some of the sense of being special and that special treatment? Like, will you feel like a VIP digitally if everyone is a VIP? It'll be interesting how that plays into the excitement and the sales for this event. Because, because it, it, there's no exclusivity. And people love that sense of exclusivity. Like, I got a ticket and I got this special spot. It's all mine. But on a live stream, that's gone. And like I said, morally, that's great. Everyone gets that special treatment. But then is it really special? You know? So... We'll see. I'm just curious what happens because I really don't know how successful KCON 2020 will be. And we'll see. The latest update in terms of live shows that I can give you is that TVXQ had their show through the SM Entertainment VR style concert app, which they had more of those VR style like special effects like a helicopter and a whole sea creature scene and stuff. And 
it was interesting because the tweets that SM Entertainment put out after TVXQ show talked about that there was a lot of fan enthusiasm, they trended on Twitter, and there were a lot of special effects, but they did not include the number of viewers in their list of stat bullet points. And in some t- sometimes they've done that when there's been a big turn on NCT127, they told us how many people tuned in. They did not for TVXQ, so I wonder how much they how many people actually tuned in? Are people getting live stream fatigue from SM Entertainment? Or just they're running out of money for SM Entertainment having all these live streams that each cost money on their own. I believe $30 each show. So by the time TVXQ had theirs, some people were already, had already spent a lot of money. (laughs) So yeah, we'll see about that. There are other versions of shows happening now, other forms people are trying to get things to take. So there's actually, this is a fashion-themed event, not a concert, but it might be a blueprint concert to use in the future. So there is this designer, Pyre Moss, who is having a drive through fashion show. So New York Fashion Week, which is still scheduled for September, is going to have fashion shows, but drive-in ones, and we'll see... I. So far, just Pyre Mosses, but we'll see. Maybe more will be confirmed. The issue is really, though, that a lot of locations don't even have the space for that. They're just not logistically suitable for a drive-in event. And so that is an issue, as well as just all the technical issues that come with playing music for a crowd that's in their cars. And we've talked about that a lot before, so I'll move on there. So there's also this new trend of people actually going to the concert venue. So this is like a new way to live stream, I guess, where they aren't doing it from their bedroom or whatever, but they're actually performing in an arena or something, but without a crowd. So it's like, I don't know if uh, how popular this joke actually is online, but I've seen this kind of meme and joke a lot online, and I use it a lot, where I think about, like, if I won the lottery, I would buy all of the seats in the concert venue, and then when the artist comes out on stage, it's just me sitting there, and I'm, like, the sole guest of honor, and so this is this crowdless concert thing is basically like that situation, but without the good part, which is when you get to be the one observer. There's just no observer. So it's basically a crowdless concert where there's no audience, but they do perform in the concert venue. And so that is continuing to happen. And some people have actually turned that event into a a fundraising event of sorts. So there is this group called RW Quarantunes, so yeah, I, I didn't, I'm not taking credit for the Quarantunes pun, by the way, everyone's using it these days. But this company, RW Quarantunes, basically turned the event into a live stream fundraiser where this guy, Kenny Loggins, has performed at this, at this concert venue. And actually, the fundraiser has raised over $3 million so far. $3 million. So people are still tuning in to this. So it's interesting because, like I said... All of this seems like we are prone for live stream fatigue, and yet the numbers of sales say otherwise. So is live stream fatigue in the near future? I I assume so, but then there are numbers like this that come out, and it just leaves me wondering if that will not be the case. So we'll see. Another thing to think about is how this quarantine era really is one where we are going to see a lot more concerts that are digital, and we've talked a lot before about that, Travis Scott and his Fortnite show and the precedent that set and everything, but it's really happening in quick succession now. So actually on the same day, a couple different social media companies announced plans to partner with AR technology or other new software to basically turn into streaming platforms and meet apps, basically adding more music and live performance elements to their own apps. So first of all, Instagram announced a partnership with this company that works with like AR filters. So basically there's going to be this new function on Instagram, maybe just as a tested feature that never gets fully dispersed to the public, but still they're testing a feature with more AR graphics that you can use in Instagram to sync up with music. So basically you're lip syncing and there's more, there's more depth to your filters on Instagram. 
And there's this other partnership Facebook announced recently with this new app called Collab. This is another thing still in the beta stage. We don't know if it'll be fully public ever, but they're testing it out. So this app called Collab is kind of similar. It sounds like musically in a way or TikTok, but like with Facebook kind of. So you can like sing and collab with singers by like posting a video where you're side to side singing like a split screen video sort of it sounds like that's kind of what they're gonna do with that so they're kind of trying to become a tiktok i guess and then so yeah insta instagram announced the ar filter collab on the same day facebook announced work with an app called collab and on the same day this third thing happened where amazon basically started promoting this new software engineer job placement. So they have a super vague new job description. So Amazon is hiring a software engineer for their music department. And this software engineer job description says that you should work for them because, quote, as we make history by launching exciting new projects in the coming year, period. That's it. As we make history by launching exciting new projects in the coming year. So if you, if you thought I was confused by the vagueness of KCON announcements, yeah, so who knows what they're up to, but they're up to some stuff, probably not revealing it because they don't want to give away secrets to the competition, Facebook and Instagram right now, who are trying to duke it out to see who wins this VR reality battle, but it'll, it'll be a very interesting future for the music scene, that's for sure. There are also rumors about a collaboration in the works between SoundCloud and Twitch, which would be interesting because that combines the live streaming that's popular on Twitch with the the under the radar artist releases that come out through SoundCloud. So that's quite a way to amplify both platforms, this mutual promotional aspect of that. So it'll be interesting. So there's there are a lot of developments in the music industry and concert industry. And as it evolves for the quarantine era, it's interesting how we're merging gaming and AR technology and music and individual work that goes into group experiences. It's all really interesting to me, so I will keep you posted on these stories in Quarantunes as always. Alright, so after the break, we are going to move on to the next segment where I talk about VIX, what their storyline is all about, and the weird, wild stories behind some of their videos. The most accurate way I think I can describe Vix and their music video stories is basically like if someone decided the Monster Mash or the Munsters or some other, think of any concept where you had different types of monsters coming together. If any song or show with that premise was a K-pop band, who would they be? And it would be Vix. So that pretty much sums it up. There are a lot of layers of Halloween-esque uh, imagery and characters and whatnot in Vic's music videos. So there's a lot to get into. Basically, a lot of it starts with their 2013 video for On and On. And it really proved their status. Their nickname is the Concept Dolls because they really are the kings of these concepts. So the big storyline for me really seems to start with On and On. And there are some ways that their videos are like a TV show in a sense where some episode plot lines do seem to be alluded to in future music videos, but sometimes also there are standalone stories. So I'll, it'll seem a lot like standalone stories, but then I'll talk about the myth, Greek mythology references that tie it all together. So first of all, with On and On, that video is basically... Yeah, I don't want to give too much away because you've just got to watch these for yourselves. They're the king of these visuals. But I will say that I'll give you a tease of these. So with On and On, that video is they're basically taken prisoner. So all the members of Vix are blindfolded and chained up and no pun intended, but they're chained up and they are basically being led into this room by these people who are unidentified, but I don't know how to describe them. Soldier, they're not really soldiers. They're, they're the guard, security guards of sorts, bodyguard type people. Anyway, so 
they went into this room and they they get their chains cut off and they get shoved into this cannon machine and they shoot out of the cannon and they're all in their own rocket. So everyone shoots out of a cannon in a different rocket. I know, it's wild. You just have to watch, trust me. And they basically, like, it seems like they turn into zombies. So I don't know what was happening in that rocket, but something weird was going on. And then they all end up on the moon and they're literally dancing on the moon and you can see the earth in the background. It's, so basically they turn into zombies as they travel to the moon. So if you thought your space mission was cool, um, no, not compa by comparison. So there's that. The next main video was Hide, which basically, it really has all these Harry Potter vibes for me because Leo has the most Severus Snape hair, but like if, Snever if Severus Snape washed his hair, that would be Leo's hair. So it, like it looks washed, but it's still that long dark hair, but Leo really rocks it. There's also this like close up in the early part of the video with a spider and so that just made me think of Ron getting freaked out by spiders in one of the Harry Potter movies. So there's the spider and the Severus Snape hair. I don't know if those details have to do with Harry Potter but that's what they reminded me of and they have scenes in like a forbidden forest. So I don't know, I'm putting the pieces together and they also have scenes though in like a palace that does not resemble Hogwarts so that's where the similarities end. But anyway, so yeah, they have scenes in the forest, scenes in this castle type building. Basically in that video, they're the creature that Vix takes on are black swans. We've talked a lot about that symbolism already, so I won't get into it. But they all sprout black wings and basically everything turns dark in the video. So like there's this main girl in the video who has this white fancy dress on, but it turns black by the end of the video and everything it, that was white turns black at the end of the video and the scene is just color wise and literally visually darker. Then their next video basically was, well I say great you, honestly some people say it differently, it's spelled G-R number eight letter U, but great you, that video starts with them watching the Hyde music video on a TV. So basically where the last music video left off, the Great You video picks up and zooms out of the... So basically if a video ended, then in the next video, it looks like it just picked up where it left off, but then you zoom out and see that it was on a TV screen. So now you're thrown for a loop. Like, wait, so is this one of those weird things where they f it feels like your brain broke because they basically showed that it's like you're watching a screen and they're watching the screen and in that screen they're watching a screen and it just goes on forever so it really kind of breaks your brain and so that happens for a while and then if I think the best music video after that came out in the t in the timeline of sorts in terms of interesting stories would probably be Voodoo Doll Voodoo Doll is a good video if you are into horror movies or just not horror or not scary as much as just thrill. Not even a thrill. It's not really like it's jump scares, but creepy. Like Tim Burton movies, really like just quirky, literally dark, yeah, Halloween-esque movies. If you're into that vibe, then this is, this is your kind of, your kind of thing, your cup of tea. So I will warn you though, Voodoo Doll is the gory one. So they have some videos with like blood and stuff, but the one where it really gets like cringy is Voodoo Doll. So if you're squeamish around needles and blood and needles touching skin, um, you probably don't want to watch the Voodoo Doll video. But it really is something because the guys literally are Voodoo Dolls. Like they literally are poked as if they are Voodoo Dolls and they're manipulated by these needles and it's a whole thing. It is cool though if you're into like cinematic effects. It's really cool how they like make their eyes X's as if they're like cartoon characters but their pupils turn into X's and it's a whole thing. So yeah, they're not just Halloween monsters. They're everything from, from astronauts to zombies to voodoo dolls. So there's a lot going on here. Two Harry Potter villains. So there's a lot happening. Anyway, so the next video I should talk about is Eternity. So Eternity is basically a dramatic 
so um, a dramatic video that's kind of Big Bang-esque in terms of the romantic cheesiness of the soap opera-esque goodbye, but they basically disappear literally into dust. Like, people are disappearing into thin air, the, like, clouds of dust are left behind. There are a lot of, there's a lot of space-time continuum brain-breaking theor theories that will leave you with a headache creating moments in that video with the space-time continuum and the clocks and turning back time or maybe turning forward time. The point is there are a lot of broken clocks and things are weird and time is warped in the Eternity video, which sounds fitting to me. Then came out Error, and Error, they basically, I don't know how to describe the creatures they are in the Error video. It's like, I would say like the top half of a mannequin, but it's made of metal and it's like a literal skeleton. So it's kind of like a skeleton mixed with Frankenstein's head. It's kind of like someone just dug through the back of a, a Halloween store's storage room and found the most gruesome yet intricately designed piece they could find. So anyway, there are these weird Frankenstein skeleton hybrid things, and half mannequin type th torsos with heads, and it's it's a whole thing. It's it's interesting. It so the lyrics really are about moving on from a relationship. Like I don't want to. One big lyric is I don't want to ruin myself anymore. And there are a lot of lyrics about that. Like I'm tearing myself apart. I need to get out of this relationship. It's bad for me. Um, but there are also these pleas in the lyrics for help, like don't forget me kind of lyrics about, you know, don't erase me from your memory types of lyrics. And so, I don't know. I was speculating, but I thought maybe when they say don't erase me from your memory, they mean literally don't erase me because, long story short, Part of this is like a computer simulation. So not only might this be a TV show in a TV show in a TV show, but this might be a computer simulation. Which level is a simulation? Or is it all a simulation? Or is the thought that we're watching them on a TV show a simulation? I don't know. But there might be a simulation involved because they keep showing computer screens that show the people and it's a whole thing. <laughs> this is why you've just got to watch it, but I'm just getting you excited about it, because this is such an underrated group. So anyway, so basically, I think when they say don't ever erase me, they might be literally just not even saying something that deep. It's don't erase me literally because I'm in this computer. Like, don't delete my data in the computer. If you get me out of the hard drive, I am done. So it's just a thought. It's just a thought. And so... I gotta move forward in the timeline a lot because it's a lot more that is just hard to explain. But yeah, and so after Era, they released Love Equation. Then I think came Destiny Love and then Beautiful Liar. And then, then it was Change Up and then Depend On Me and then Dynamite. So Dynamite basically seemed like, um, Dynamite seems like a colorful and bright and happier departure from their previously dark concepts, but there are a lot of little easter eggs in the Dynamite video that remind you of past videos. Like, there is this, there basically there's the scene where they're trapped in a box, this big clear box with a lot of clouds of smoke in it, and those same clouds of pink smoke show up in another video in the future. They're the glass walls and them being unable to touch their loved one on the other side all dramatically and Big Bang-esque. They um, th they have those moments, too, with the glass wall in this video. So it's a happy, cheerful video with a more somber, hidden tone alluded to it through the symbols. And then came fantasy. The fantasy, uh, okay, t the fantasy era, if you watch any of these videos, they will all be fascinating to you. But the one that will really just, in, gen in general, make you think visually, this is so aesthetic and just you can see what the big deal is, I would recommend the fantasy video. I think that's the biggest crowd pleaser, so if you're not into the the super over-the-top cinema style videos, but you like the drama a little, the like the tamer version of their Halloween-esque concepts is fantasy, so it's the most crowd-pleasing of their videos, I think. 
so I would check out fantasy. That is the era that really got me hooked on Vix. So I became more of a harder fan, a more hardcore fan after fantasy. That was the big defining era for me. And in that video, they are in this dark woods. The pink smoke is in the background in different moments. There is there's actually a fantasy video and a fantasy drama version. So the drama version is what I would watch for the story. But if you don't care about plot and you just like staring at a video with less action, then you can watch the regular version. But I prefer the drama version. In the drama version... There, there's basically, there are these floating chairs all over the place, there are lamps all over the place, there's this boat with all these candles on it, and there's a lot we're going to, we're going to unpack the symbolism as we talk about mythology later, but I will say fantasy was an era where they really started going all out with symbols, and they had, there's this dinner table scene with all the potions on the table, all of that will be relevant later in our discussion. I will also say, Ravi is blonde here, and... So the blonde one you see in the chair with the gold crown is Ravi. The gold crown that he gets to wear is super symbolic. We will get back to that. So so yeah, and then this, I believe the same video of fantasy ends with Leo tied up by ropes. So there's this scene where they're at this lawn table and there's potions laid out and stuff. But then they all suddenly leave and Leo's the only one left. So he's left alone at the table everything's thrown thrown askew and everything, and he's all tied up in a chair. And so they basically, it's interesting because he's tied up kind of like he was in the very first video of this whole saga on and on, so it's kind of a throwback. I don't know if that was intentional, but that's what I thought of when I saw it. And the video ends with all the members holding black masks up to their face. So they're holding up these masks that... It really reminded me of the Mass and the Singularity video from BTS. It's really that mask. And so they're holding that up in front of their faces. Obviously, we're talking about the persona, wearing a mask, concealing your true self. All those concepts we already talked about when we talked about the BTS video universe. Feel free to check out those BTS episodes for a refresher if you want to. And so then after a few more videos came out in the timeline... We moved on to the scientist era. The scientist era and the Shangri-La era and all that comes after it. So basically, this is when we get into... It'll make the most sense now to get into the mythology references here. So a little backstory if you need a crash course on Greek mythology real quick. So the three main characters we have in... The Vix album trilogy were called Kratos, Hades, and Zelos, I believe. So Kratos, Hades, and Zelos, but Zeus plays a huge role in this series as well. So Zelos is the god of jealousy, basically. Technically the god of evil rivalry, emulation, um, zeal, which is hence the name Zelos. So yeah, he's he's a jealous one. Kratos is the personification of brute force and strength. He's um, a relative of Olympian gods, and you can tell it with his personality. Fun fact, one of Kratos' siblings is called Nike, who is the personification of victory, which I'm assuming is why the athletic brand Nike named themselves that. So Nike and Kratos are brothers, but what I think is confusing is that in this trilogy, we have Zelos, Kratos, and Hades, but Kratos is actually not like the others, as in Kratos is not a god. Kratos is part of his personality. So basically, Zeus has kind of like an angel devil on his shoulder situation going on in his head, only not, I guess that's not a good analogy because it's not really like a moral dilemma thing, but like their voices in his head essentially and their personifications of his identity. Although personification is also probably not the way to put it because these are gods and goddesses. But you know what I mean. So Kratos does not exist outside of Zeus's head. So Kratos is within Zeus as well as Nike and his other siblings. And Hades is Zeus's brother who does exist outside of him. So Zeus and Hades are brothers. Kratos resides in Zeus's head. Got that? Alright, so Hades is the god of the underworld. It's so funny 
I don't remember the exact story, but basically it was like drawing straws or rock, paper, scissors or something like that. It was that level of arbitrariness that led to the decision for Hades to be the one who lost and had to go rule the underworld. So that uh, naturally he holds a grudge because he got the shorter stick when they drew straws or whatever. So Hades rules the underworld and his name actually means the unseen. So uh, one of his other nicknames is the wealthy one. Um, because that's the translation of his other name, Pluton, but that's beside the point. So yeah, Hades is the unseen, he has to live in the underworld, and he does not like that. And Hades holds on to this guy's soul. So he holds on to souls the way I picture, like, Voldemort holding on to souls, where it's like, it's, it's like a horcrux situation. Uh, so, it, yeah, it sounds like that's kind of what's going on, so... Anyways, okay, so Hades runs the underworld and his brothers with Zeus. And in Zeus's head lives Kratos. We got all that? Alright, so the next character that is thrown into the picture is Demeter. So Hades and Zeus are brothers, but Demeter is Zeus's wife and their sister. So yeah, Zeus and Demeter, I guess, are like married, but marriages and relationships are very weird and familial and whatnot in Greek mythology. So just go with it. It's quite a complex family tree that's really weird and has a lot of a lot going on um, internally with the bloodline, but that's how it is in Greek mythology, I guess. So anyway, so Zeus and Demeter are siblings and married, and they have this girl, Persephone. And so basically, so we have to, yeah, so Persephone, I'm not going to go into the whole family tree, but I think you get the point. So that there are these gods and Persephone is one of their daughters. Kratos is part of someone's imagination. I think that that's a pretty good uh, starting point to get the story. So, so let's talk about Persephone's main story. So this story basically is used to describe how our seasons came to be. And this is honestly, like, I think about stories so literally. Like, if you heard one of my previous episodes where I talk about Narcissus and the symbolism behind him, for BTS and SF9, they both reference Narcissus in their work. Uh, I just couldn't help but laugh over it because I like taking these these literally. And I know, yeah, it's like fables, and you have to think about the moral of the story and not the actual logistics of the story, but come on. Narcissus is a funny story, if you think about it. I mean, the guy fell in love with himself, but he didn't realize that for years. So he's dating himself, basically. He's in a romantic relationship, and then it suddenly he, he has the shock revelation that it's been him, his reflection he's been dating the whole time. That's hilarious. So we're going to have to talk about things that are also hilarious to me, just in terms of thinking about this actually happening. So I will probably be like that again as I tell these stories. So the story of Persephone. So basically, Persephone, she was in this meadow flower picking one day, and Hades, who's in the underworld, I guess wanted her as his wife because he has this crush on her. And so, so yeah, so basically, she's his, I guess she's, because I would say she would be, because if Hades is the brother of Zeus, Persephone would be his niece, but... I guess, I don't think family trees work that way in the world of mythology. So anyway, so he wants Persephone as his wife and queen. So she's just la 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 picking flowers in a meadow and Hades like somehow gets the ground to break beneath her and she falls into the underworld and then they're going to be forced to live together. And so Demeter, who is Persephone's mom, goes looking for her and realizes that she's gone. And so she is so distraught, she's mourning the loss of her daughter. And she's so distraught and caught up with her grief and distracted by it that she doesn't do her chores. So Demeter doesn't do what she's known for, which is agriculture and things like that. So the things that she would help do to sustain life are not happening because she's not doing anything. She's not growing crops or anything. So the world is in this famine and there's it's just a real in a real bad state because she can't concentrate and she's mourning and not doing her her tasks. And so 
Zeus is like, all right, that's enough. We need food. So he's like, Hermes, he sends this guy Hermes. He's like, go get Persephone back because we need Dimitri to get back, to, or Demeter to get back to work. And so Hermes goes to fetch Persephone. Um, and he does, and he brings her back. So everyone's like, yay, she's back. And then Persephone is like, Oh, guys, um, I should have said this earlier, but I kind of ate a pomegranate seed when I was down there. And then they're like, oh, no, because apparently there's this rule that if you're in the underworld and you eat anything there, then you're bound for life to stay down there. And so they're like, oh, no, let's follow this rule that is in no way arbitrary. This is a real sin. She ate the pomegranate seed. So they make her go back down there after she's pulled back up. And so she's down there again. And then they're like, but what do we do now? We just said we wanted Demeter to get back to work, but she's back to mourning. Why? How do we mess this up? We They really should have just changed the rules, but I digress. So... Zeus is like, all right, you know what, let's do a compromise here. So, Persephone, you're going to spend one-third of your time down there. And then the other two-thirds of the year, you're going to be up here back with your mom. So that at least she's not mourning all the time, just one-third of the time. And so they agree to that compromise. And so that's how the seasons were apparently created, according to this story. So winter is dark and cold and the trees are bare and it's, you know, things aren't growing because those are the months of Demeter mourning her daughter because she misses her and she's spending her, spending her winters in the underworld with her husband, I guess. And then the other parts of the year she's here, crops are growing and whatnot. So... In terms of how climate change would play into this story, I'm guessing Persephone just really fell in love with Hades because she's spending a lot of time down there these days. So anyway, so that is basically the story of Persephone and how the how all of that came to be, really. All right, let's uh, let's. I need to share. I'm gonna share the stories and then get back to the connections to Vix and the symbols. So there's this other story. That I find funny. So basically, Homer's Odyssey, we're not going to talk about that would take literally hours. But this part in Homer's Odyssey that's super relevant here is that there's basically this scene where there's this feast and it looks like your regular feast, but they like hid p potions in it. Like secretly, like you're not drinking tea or drinking potions or whatever. So the dinner guests turn into pigs turn into swine technically and so that happened that is one way to get back at bad dinner guests I guess then um there's this other story there's so many I could share there's one where okay this is a little bit gory but it it's relevant here I guess um so basically um Prometheus gets chained up which, you know, the, there's a Vic song called Chained Up, so you get the connections here. So Prometheus basically sees that Zeus is treating humanity terribly. Zeus is just not a people person. Zeus really looks at humans and scoffs at them. He's like, stupid humans. So Prometheus is like, you're being really harsh to humanity. Can you knock it off? And, but, you know, no, he's not going to do that. Um... So Prometheus is like, fine, if you're not going to help them and see the best of humans, I will. So he steals this fire from Zeus, like literal fire he takes from him and like gives it to humanity to do what? I don't know, I guess like grow stuff, like like cook, cook over it or something. But anyway, so he gave us fire and so... Prometheus wanted to give humans something because Zeus wasn't, but Zeus was like, you stole my fire and you gave it to those people? Like, he's really, he's really ticked off about this. And so, basically, Kratos, who is, you know, the character in Zeus's mind that gets him to do bad stuff, Kratos basically uh, convinces this other guy to chain up Prometheus. So, the like devil on in his in Zeus's head tells him to chain up Prometheus for his crime and so Prometheus gets tied up to this rock but Zeus is so extra that he's like no that's not even like dramatic looking enough so he sends an eagle down to like pick at Prometheus's like limbs 
And so, okay, skip skip ahead like 20 seconds if you don't like gory descriptions, but right here is when... So, basically, Prometheus, like, is kind of like, his organs are, like, regrowing, so, like, he's... It sounds like he's, like, dead, but gods can't die, so he's not dead, but, like, his liver and other organs are, like, re... Like, they're, sh like, getting pecked at by eagles, but then they reform and they grow back, and so Zeus just keeps sending eagles to... E an eagle one after the other to Prometheus to like peck at the organs to get them back to the deflated state. He's just like relentless. He is really too much. So anyway, so Zeus continues to be extra and sends those eagles down. And then Hercules, who is somehow involved in this story, he jumps in. He's like, not the Disney Hercules. This guy is a little more intense but Hercules shows up and he eventually is like enough isn't enough you're torturing Prometheus so he shoots the eagle and he frees Prometheus unties him from the rock and then Prometheus is spared so what is the lesson from that story I don't know I'm guessing that it is about that it's actually a good thing to see good in people and help humans <laughs> I'm guessing that's the story but it is it, yeah, it is what you want to think of it, I guess. So some of the symbols to look out for next time you watch Vic's music videos is, first of all, especially in the Shangri-La video, you'll notice that some scenes are upside down, and there's like the right-side-up world and the upside-down world in contrast to each other. And so whichever characters are upside down and sitting on the flip side world that seems to be about Hades and the underworld so keep that in mind in the Shangri-La video as well they also have this scene where they're dancing in water and whenever you see bodies of water there are two possible meanings at least that I've drawn based on what I know about Greek mythology one way is it could be about the Narcissus story where Narcissus fell in love with his reflection by seeing it in the water and that whole story and that, side note, I feel like Echo, as a musician, they should have included Echo, the nymph character who is involved in the narcissist story. Echo should have played a bigger role in the symbolism throughout Vic's videos, but that's just a little nerdy uh, complaint of mine <laughs> so that, that only Greek mythology buffs will appreciate. And the other meaning for the water could be having to do with the fairy of sticks so the way to get to the underworld is cr riding this little fairy or like a boat to sticks so s-t-y-x it's a place so this sticks river of sorts is how you get there so anytime you see a boat in the a candlelit boat ride or something like that in a vix video i'm assuming that's referencing the river but any body of water in the video could represent that river and that transition from the world we live in to the upside down world which is the underworld in this situation so those are some things to keep in mind also the feast so whenever you see that long dining table especially with potions on it there are a lot of potions in vix videos those are those are reflective of the scene in the Odyssey where they, they put, the guests are turned into pigs, I guess. So that could be a lesson. Um, so a lot of this, by the way, both myth, in terms of the actual myths and the Vix videos, is up to interpretations as always. K-pop videos are all about that. So I'm not confirming or denying which Greek symbols are explicitly linked to other to music video references that's for listeners and viewers to decide for themselves so i'm just putting it out there but these are things to keep an eye out for to use to reach your own conclusions another thing to keep in mind is that gold crown that i mentioned before so ravi's character is wearing that crown actually those were popularized by one of zeus's many sons so zeus's son apollo was the character known to kind of like make it trendy make it happen so Apollo is like, yeah, he was successful at making the the crown trendy, so that is representative of Zeus and his influence and power, and also keep in mind that in this story you hear Zeus about Zeus so much because he was such a player. He had like a bajillion wives and then a bajillion kids, so if you hear like, wait, Zeus is also his dad, and Zeus is his dad, and that's Zeus's wife too, and how many wives does Zeus have? Yeah, Zeus was 
quite something. So you'll hear his name a lot whenever you read these types of stories. His power is all over the place because of that. The other big symbolism to look out for would be Leo tied to that rock. So that's the pr that is representative of that Prometheus story where that character was tied up because he criticized Zeus. So a lot of this has to go back to Zeus's power, really, and how in Zeus's head there's Kratos and other voices making him do terrible things. Also, the symbolism of... I'm, I'm guessing that the girl main character in a lot of Vic's videos is in the later, in their later, more, or more recent videos, is Persephone, that girl, um, but that's up to interpretation as well. Ambrosio is probably Leo, the one who, I believe he was the one tied up, but if not, he is a big character anyway in the story, so Leo, is the one with the Severus Snape hair in that one video, he is Ambrosio, who's the one, this is my interpretation, whose soul is held by, like, in a Voldemort-esque way, which I find funny, that the Severus Snape guy's soul is being held by Voldemort, it just all makes sense. So, so yeah, so the soul, we've got the potions at the dinner table that turn people into pigs, we've got the the being tied up, we've got the gold crown and the popularization of crowns, we've got the river and the bodies of water, we've got, you know, falling in love with your reflection, a lot of symbols here. The underworld in general, things that are upside down, I could go on and on. One or two more things I wanted to mention. So, the deer. There is a scene in, I believe, the Shangri-La video where one of the characters is face-to-face -face with this deer. And so, this de the deer is associated with this character, Artemis. And Artemis is a goddess of childbirth. So, the story of Artemis, long story short, it's kind of funny. So, basically, this guy is a total creep peeping at Artemis. And she spots him, and she she gets rightfully ticked off, so she turns him into a deer. And that's pretty much the story. So Artemis um, basically just, yeah, called out that that weirdo staring at her and turned him into a deer. So, there, you know, you could debate if that symbolizes, you know, temptation or lust or greed or whatever, but the the deer symbolism is there. So that's another thing to look out for as well. Um, I would also, also, one thing that seems to connect a lot of these stories is that there's this character, Hera. So Hera basically is known for having this scepter that has a pomegranate imagery on it, and which is a symbol of fertility in Greek myths, and the pomegranate, you know, related to the seed that Persephone ate that made them think she needed to stay in the underworld for some reason. So Hera has that symbolism as well on this scepter. In Hera Hara, sorry, I don't know. I, um, so Hera is one of Zeus's many, many wives, and this is kind of a side story, but it could be more related to Vic's videos than I think. I don't know. But Hera is just... Basically, Zeus took Hera and was so aggressive, so he basically pursued her and, like, stopped the competition by getting all these other guys to, like, go away. So, like, Zeus wanted Hera because he was naturally lonely. It's not like he had a million other wives. And so he basically, the other people who were, who wanted to be with Hera, he basically turned away by using his magic powers. So, like, one of them somehow he, like, they say that he fashioned a cloud in Hera's image. So, like, this guy didn't realize he was actually dating a cloud that looked, that was turned into someone who looked like Hera. But it was a cloud, which is actually just as funny to me as that guy who suddenly realized he was dating his reflection the whole time. The And this other guy, he was, like, put in... He was basically killed. I mean, put into eternal sleep um, by Zeus to get him to stop pursuing her. And, I mean, this, it's wild what Zeus would do to hold on to people. He's just the worst. But this, for story's sake, quite an amusing character. So... That, those are some main things to keep in mind. So Hera might actually, I don't know if Hera is really represented as a, as an actual being in the Vix videos, but her, her influence seems to be there. Zeus's wrath is definitely in there, and that inner Kratos voice of his influencing him is definitely there. There is a lot more I could say, but I will let you watch the videos and see for yourself and try to spot all these symbols and more. Make a game out of it. 
And uh, yeah, so that is what I will say for today about the Vic storyline, is that it's a lot of, yeah, a lot of otherworldly stuff, and it's very fascinating to watch and hear about. And if this is super interesting, then maybe I'll talk more about mythology references in K-pop on the show in the future, because there are many, actually, and they're just so funny to me, some of them, and just so wild. So something to think about that I might include on future episodes. Feel free to let me know, tag me on socials, 17 Care K-pop, to discuss this more, and also keep in mind that I might, in the future, if you're interested, share on the show my own myth, because when I was, this was, gosh, how many years ago, close to a decade ago in school, I, uh, one of our assignments was actually to create our own Greek myth with all these typical elements you read about in a myth. So I did that. So I actually wrote a myth about how the sky came into existence. It's honestly a pretty convincing myth. If we're talking about the level of convincing that these myths are, if a guy can fall in love with his reflection, the sky can be built based on my story. So maybe I'll share that myth on the show just for fun. So we'll see about that. And there's, yeah, there's a lot more I could go on about, but I think you get the gist. So that wraps up my VIX review for now. Before we go, I would like to give you all my typical good news roundup of just miscellaneous good things happening in the world that I enjoyed reading and hearing about that reminds me of all the good still in the world. So here's my latest roundup of 13 of those things. So, yeah, usually I like to pick the number 17 because 17, but there are 13 members in 17, so this symbolism will do. Anyway, so remember when I told you about the 100-year-old man in the UK, Tom Moore, who basically raised 32 million pounds worth of donations for the UK health services by walking yard walking around his backyard well due to his donation he is officially being given knighthood so as if this story couldn't get cooler and sweeter tom moore not only raised so much money for the health services in the uk but he's getting knighted there for his charity and he's a hundred years old so happy birthday to tom moore i'm just so excited for this to happen and so glad people like him are out there there are also a lot of people on the other side of the the age range who are really making a difference. So I would just like to shout out Jaquil Jackson in Chicago, a 12-year-old who started a project called Project I Am, where basically the project is all about making these bags for senior citizens with things that are useful for them right now hygiene products and other necessities so basically these blessing bags are being distributed to they're literally called blessing bags that project I am is distributing to senior citizens in Chicago and that's really awesome other people making a big difference right now there are so many the another young one that I really liked hearing about was a 10 year old named Chelsea Fair who started a nonprofit so Chelsea's nonprofit has basically been all about helping and improving the mood and creative creative outlet abilities, access to creative outlets for people living in homeless shelters and foster care homes. So art kits have been sent to over 1,500 children in foster care homes and homeless shelters. So she basically creates these art kits and sends them to those people who would otherwise not have art as a form of expression and art can be so therapeutic so that is really really wonderful to see and speaking of therapeutic there have been there have been a lot of attempts to help first line workers of course in all sorts of ways and not just on the job so in Atlanta the plaza is actually has actually started hosting private movie screenings for healthcare workers only and their families so so Healthcare workers and their families are obviously dealing with so much stress right now, and so they get free private movie screenings to go to, probably drive-in screenings, um, and so that that's just a really great thing. Hopefully, whenever, if they ever get a break, they can spend their break time watching a movie or doing something else distracting. More people helping out, so... In Ghana, two brothers basically created this solar-powered 
hand washing basin and it has this automated timer in it for 20 seconds so it's not only awesome and solar powered and eco-friendly but it makes sure that you wash your hands for the required 20 seconds recommended by the CDC so that is a very cool invention and similar ones will hopefully be created all over the world more awareness is being spread through the Pass the Mic campaign so this basically has been a way where big time celebrities like Shailene Woodley and Penelope Cruz and a lot more. A lot of celebrities have been giving their Instagram accounts to a frontline worker or a medical expert. I believe mostly medical experts, but anyway, people really in the roots of this crisis and the ones who have the facts. So these celebrities are using their power and influence to make sure that their viewers see and get the truth about the crisis and so they are helping medical experts get that tool for showing their stories and what's really going on and so I think that's really great. If you also just want to hear more about different situations that people are going through, I really like this podcast called The Window I believe uh, and it's just a window into people's daily lives. They all just, they, they have their voice recording sent into this show and talk about what their life is like. They're short episodes, less than a half hour each, I believe, and they're just very interesting, just hearing people's stories, so I would check that out. And other people that are helping out, there are so many. So there, so I need to shout out Tashua Parker. So my next shout out goes to Tashua Parker, who lives in Gustavus, Alaska, and this small town does not even have a grocery store and or it does but it shut down I don't remember the specifics so I apologize for that but basically Tashua town is going hungry and so he has been making a 14 hour trip 14 hours every single week to Juneau Alaska to get supplies for his town to get food and other necessities a 14 hour trip every single week so that is that is just huge and he just kind of used it as well it's what you got to do but wow we should celebrate people like that more often that just do with what should be done to help people that's awesome also shout out to jake bland jake bland is a garbage man in kentucky and on his route he was he noticed that an elderly woman continuously had stopped putting out her trash can on the side of the road for trash day and so he was wondering what was going on there, and so he 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 wanted to know what was going on, and he checked in on her, and after he got permission to check in on her, he did, and he realized that she wasn't putting out the trash can because she didn't have any trash, because she didn't have anything else to eat, so he looked in her fridge and pantry, and sure enough, there was nothing in there. This old woman couldn't travel anywhere to go get stuff. She didn't have relatives to go drop stuff at her door. She just had nothing, so she stayed in her home. And so Jake made her put together a grocery list. He wasn't satisfied with how long the list was, so he made her add more and more to it. And then he went to go get it all. And yeah, so he, he made that grocery run for her. And now the company heard about this and has officially made it a habit to check in on elderly customers. So... People on their garbage routes who are elderly people that they know of in this small community, they they now have, as part of their daily tasks, to go check on them, see how they're doing, and be aware of that possibility. So that is something to keep in mind, too, in your own neighborhood. If someone has not been putting out the trash or something else is off, like as in they're not... Because everyone is home these days, so yeah, it might seem like it's not off, that you don't see them for days because they're stuck inside. But really, there are some signs still to look out for. If, if that just, you know, someone may want to call or you to just, you know, I don't know, send put a note in their mailbox, just ask if everything's okay and make sure they have what they need. So it's a great reminder to do that if you can. Another shout out goes to Josh Crowell from New Hampshire. So he is a postal worker in New Hampshire who is giving out Dunkin' Donuts gift cards and handwritten congratulation notes to 2020 graduates on his route, which is so nice. And now, yeah, a lot of people are nice, and I, but I also want to talk more about some animals now who are also nice. So 
remember the penguins I talked about in the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago who are just walking around because the people are gone so penguins can roam free in the aquarium? They've moved on to higher class stuff. They are really moving up, up in terms of social status. So now they are touring museums. So that's just the latest. That's it. That's the story. Penguins in an art museum. But I love to hear it and you love to hear it too. You know it. And now animals in the digital world we have to talk about. So an Animal Crossing, which I just, I, I hope I have more stories to share about Animal Crossing in the future because it's just so cute and wholesome and the kind of content we need right now. But anyway, so Ramadan is, is a holiday that is very communal in nature. It is celebrated with a lot of family and friends. It's a big group collective thing. It's a celebrating com- in a community and that's really obviously hard due to the COVID pandemic, just logistically and just in terms of the health and safety guidelines. So um, so a game developer has basically Ish- Ishamil, I believe, I apologize if it's Ishamil, but Ishamil he, um, basically is a game developer and he, he basically created a way to celebrate Ramadan and Animal Crossing. So, so basically... If, People who celebrate Ramadan are sharing, have shared dodo codes with each other so they can visit each other's islands and celebrate Ramadan in the game, which is the cutest thing. And I just, yeah, that's the story. Again, it's just really cute, wonderful ways people are finding ways to carry on traditions and bond with each other. Now, there are even ways to bond with each other now at restaurants. So people are getting very creative with how they social distance at restaurants. In Germany, there's a restaurant where people are wearing pool noodle hats, so like really weird looking headbands with pool noodles sticking out of them. There's a place in, I believe it's up north in the USA, up by like Maine, where people are sit like not in inner tubes, but like the tables kind of look like inner tubes with holes in the center. So they're like eating in what looks like an inner tube in the middle of this thing and so it's just funny to me how people are so weird and clever uh, with how they're finding ways to stay six feet apart also actually probably the better than that um is how japan is doing it where they have this cafe in japan now that is putting out giant stuffed capybaras stuffed animal capybaras to enforce social distancing between people at the restaurant and if you don't know what a capybara is, you should look it up. It's very interesting. <laughs> and and I, I think it's pretty cute, but, you know, that's debated, I guess. But, yeah, a capybara. And, you know, I just, I feel like we should make better use of stuffed animals here in the USA as well, because that's cute. And that wraps up my list of, yep, that wraps up my list of good news stories that I wanted to bring attention to but of course there will be more that I discuss in the future and before we go I just want to make my recommendations for you. My what to watch recommendation of the day is the latest awesome performance from Road to Kingdom. So in the Road to Kingdom show you can check this out on YouTube. Very very and two both boy groups teamed up and performed on by BTS and their cover is really fun to watch so I highly recommend it. And what to listen to? There is this artist who's kind of R&B named Moon. Her stage name is Moon and she has her voice is really something. It reminds me a little of Lehigh, just in the sense that it is a voice that really carries the song. So a song can sound really boring, but not when she sings it. She can sing the phone book if she wants to. So her voice is just very cool and unique and satisfying, just like Lehigh's. So I would check out Moon. Her song now is probably my favorite, or I think it's called Why Do You Say? Or What Do You Say? I think it's Why Do You Say, though. Her collab with Ash Island, who I already talked about just a day or two ago. So yeah, I would definitely check out Why Do You Say and Now and basically anything else by Moon. She also recently dropped a collab with Vince that's really good. So yeah, I just really think she's underrated and she's got a great voice. So please check her out. All right, a lot more recommendations for you in future episodes, a lot more stories, a lot more to discuss. So stay tuned and I will see you all soon. Have a good one.